Welcome back to our next episode of Ideas in Progress, brought to you by the Institute for Humane Studies, where we support faculty and graduate students, help them advance their careers with a wide catalog of wonderful academic programs. Things like our recent graduate student discussion colloquium on the Federalists and Anti-Federalists with discussion leader Brad Berzer. Professor Berzer is an historian specializing in Jacksonian America and the American West at Hillsdale College, and he joins us now to give us his thoughts. So, Professor Berzer, are you now or have you ever been a Federalist? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I get the third degree immediately. Um, Anthony, thanks for having me on. It's great to be talking with you and always to do things with IHS. So I'm, I'm very, very glad to be here. Am I a Federalist or have I ever been? Yeah, you know, actually, I would say when I was a high school debater, so way back in the 80s, I was a, I would have considered myself a huge Federalist, still a free market libertarian at the time. But I was really into James Madison, and strangely enough, I had a, an overnight radio show during the summers when I was in high school, and in between commercial breaks, when I wasn't deciding what songs were on, uh, and it was a rock station, I actually would read the Federalist Papers. That's how nerdy I was back in high school. <laughs> so yeah, I was very taken with them. Of course, at the time, I thought they were perfect. As I've gotten older, definitely thought of myself more as a kind of conservative anti-Federalist or an extremely liberal and open federalist. I think there were really good things that both sides brought to the table. And, you know, again, if we're going to have a government, which in our foreseeable future we are, I think that probably the best solution is to go for a kind of small libertarian republic, a very localized one. So now that sounds an awful lot to me like you, when you do identify with the federalist tradition, it, it really is, say, in that 1790s context of the early republic. Um, but, you know, when you shift to different decades, federalism always means something different. Right. Uh, so, you know, are, is that correct that you'd say you're a federalist in that sort of 1780s, 1790s uh, context of the Constitutional Convention, um, but not necessarily a federalist in the Jacksonian period or, say, the 1950s? Uh, you know, uh, would you have been a federalist throughout uh, the, the sort of um, uh, wide span of American history, or is it more isolated to a particular time and context? Yes, I, I was thinking very specifically of 1787, 88, and 89. Um, so really not much beyond that, but very specifically large F federalist thinking of Madison more than Jay or Hamilton, but definitely a kind of Madisonian, which I, I think at the time, no, again, don't get me wrong. I think there were great things about the Articles of Confederation, but I also think that Madison brought up some very good arguments that if we're going to have a republic, there are probably some things that we need to shape. Now, obviously, and, and you and I have talked about this, Anthony, I think there were grave mistakes that the founders made. And I don't think that's... I. I don't think that's just in hindsight we can say that. I think there were people at the time, including the anti-federalists, who recognized what those grave mistakes were. And I wish the federalists had been a little more circumspect about it. But obviously, we are where we are, and history did occur the way it occurred. What do you think were some of the things that the Articles of Confederation did the best? You know, the, the, I think the very fact that we didn't immediately go into a counter-revolution or some kind of devolved revolution, you know, we did have skirmishes, but that was not atypical. We had some bloodshed. We had some violence. But again, not atypical. If we take seriously the histories of the Middle Ages, then when we had a kind of Christian republic, if, if, one, if such a thing ever existed, uh, especially in Anglo-Saxon areas and other Germanic areas, uh, Iceland and so forth, there was a lot of bloodshed. And bloodshed seems to be, at least the threat of it, kind of a part of having a free society in some ways. Uh, so, you know, I'd rather avoid it, but obviously there was the threat that existed. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a possibility that we could have gone in different directions, but I, as it was, I mean, there we are. And uh, I think the Articles Confederation were very good. 
at preventing a further revolution. I think they maintained a certain sort of stability, whatever the problems. But you know, there are other things they did as well. Obviously, we defeated the British with a huge help from the French and the Dutch and the Danish. Uh, we were able to defeat the British, but we were able to do that under the Articles of Confederation. And we also were able to pass the Northwest Ordinance, which I think is you know, arguably the most Republican law ever passed in the history of republics. So I think there are a lot of good things that came out of the articles. Can you uh, break down that point about the Northwest Ordinance for our listeners? Sure. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Northwest Ordinance. So it was passed unanimously on July 13th of 1787. And of course, you can think about two foundings. We have one group of founders, those with Madison and the Constitutional Convention are in Philadelphia. But we have another group of founders who are the first congressmen up in the Articles of Confederation Congress in New York. And they're doing really interesting things. And the idea and the fact that they're able to get passed unanimously this bill that would prevent slavery in particular in what's now Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, in these areas, the fact that they were able to, to prevent that, I think is astounding. And to do so with debate, but with a unanimous vote, which of course the articles demanded for a bill that large. But the Northwest Ordinance, in my mind, is really as important as the Declaration of Independence, is as important as the Articles and the Constitution, really ranks up there with the Bill of Rights. I think it should be regarded as one of the great founding documents. And I believe, if I remember correctly, at our at our discussion colloquium, you mentioned that uh, Abraham Lincoln considered it one of the fundamental uh, laws. Right. In the Lincolnian period, they often referred to it as one of the four organic laws, along with the Declaration, the Articles, and the Constitution. You know, I, I find, find it amazing that uh, there was this period, you know, like the Articles seem like such a unique moment in world history, where the, it genuinely is this organization that other governments can voluntarily join to create this new sort of organization that doesn't operate on territorial conquest and internal coups that switch the, the ruling class from you know one side to another. Uh, but it, it really is this sort of sisterhood of Republican nations, unlike anything that has really existed, certainly in the modern day, maybe not since, you know, the thousand colonies of ancient Greece or something. Was there was there something similar? Uh, it's, it's a really unique moment that almost seems spoiled by what followed. Yeah, you stated beautifully, Anthony. Anthony, I agree with you completely. I think it was an incredible moment. And, you know, I, it, it, in that Northwest Ordinance especially, it's not just that it's anti-slavery. It also demands that there is a respect for property rights and our property rights, not just for white Americans, but for American Indians as well. And of course, we know the history of the United States never played out that way, but there was this kind of ideal moment where things could have gone in a very different direction. It's amazing, too, that they got all these states like uh, like Virginia or Pennsylvania to give up their Western land claims. That's oh, incredible. You know, for the for the benefit of some other future states left to be determined. That's right. You know, states just, that would not, you know, theoretically be a part of an empire, but instead a, a brotherhood of republics. Yeah, just incredible. So it kind of it kind of does surprise me that that people so uh, offhandedly uh, just uh, remark that the articles were a failure simply because they didn't last very long. Yeah, you know, there's a long tradition of that, and I think part of it is what we discussed at that great weekend with IHS. I mean, I, I think a large part of it is that that anti-federalist tradition, for better or worse latches onto, or at least those who come after, latch onto that anti-federalist tradition, and it gets mixed up with the issues of slavery and state, states' rights, and it becomes tainted in some weird way that I think is actually an inversion of what the original intent was. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you said that you thought the the uh, greatest benefit or, or uh, triumph of the articles was in preventing a counter-revolution and further bloodshed, and it actually did promote stability. Um, but, you know, I think the refrain that we're used to hearing by now then from the historical profession is, well, look, both of these regimes, the, the Articles of Confederation and later the Constitution, both of them were actually set up specifically to maintain a system of bloodshed, especially in the South on the plantation um, or what would become the, the cotton plantations of the Deep South. 
um, that these regimes uh, promoted stability for some, specifically so those elite few could exploit huge numbers of other people. Um, I mean, is that the kind of stability that we really want? No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, Anthony, what a, what a great way of putting it. And, and clearly we see there history being used to serve very specific interests. And you have to give some credit to the South as much as you and I hate slavery and disagree with them. They were incredible at propaganda and being able to kind of play into the idea of the lost cause and the noble cause and to, to create a kind of aura around what they're doing that obviously it's uh, really obscured the true intent of promoting slavery. Now let's talk a bit about the readings from the discussion colloquium. Sure. Um, we have a lot of selections from uh, Carrie and McClellan's The Federalist, which which I suppose you were reading uh, maybe the same edition back at the radio station. You no, that one, that one wasn't out yet. So no, <laughs> oh, I had I okay. old paperback, I think the Signet edition. And <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. And then we have, we also have Herbert Storing's The Anti-Federalist, which of course is, is not something that uh, many students will be able to encounter throughout their educations. You usually don't see any writings from the Anti-Federalists included on syllabi. Um, maybe if you're lucky, your your professor will have picked up an interest in some anti-federalists along the way. But you know, both of these are excellent document readers. I'm wondering, did you have do you have any particularly uh, favorite readings from the primary sources that we read? Yeah, so you know that that Liberty Fund version of the Federalist paper is by far the best one I've seen, and there are a lot of competitors out there. But I think that the that that version in particular. Its greatest strength, and this may sound really odd, Anthony, but I think its greatest strength is its index. That index is <laughs> masterful. And you know, you get a sense by looking at it just right away what the Federalists were really interested in, what they weren't interested in. So, you know, the declaration is only mentioned once. Uh, you find that Locke is only referenced. I think once, if at all, and you have something like 75 to 80 references to the classical world within the Federalist Papers. So I've actually handed out index out before to my students just to go through it, uh, just to look at what's important and what's not within those Federalist Papers. But yeah, that's a beautiful edition, and I've had that hardback at least since it came out, and Liberty Fund released that. So really great. Um, I like the storing too. Storing obviously is coming from a very very Straussian viewpoint. And I think that some of the selections he picks kind of reflect that. You know, I think he's trying to show that, yes, there were good things among the anti-federalists, but still, ultimately, he's looking for that kind of nationalism that might be lurking around the corner, and especially through the federalists. Uh, I really like it. I don't know if you've seen this one, Anthony, uh, but I really like Bruce Fronin's collection mm -hmm. that came out from Regnery maybe 20 years ago now of the anti-federalist papers. That's generally the one that I reference. I also, I think uh, Bruce, you know, as much as a curmudgeon, uh, as a curmudgeon as he is, is a, a really brilliant guy. And there's a lot in those papers, especially in his index and then in the footnotes that I think gives a great context to what the anti-federalists were trying to do and you know, what, what their problems were. Obviously, they were a group of very disparate individuals, unlike the federalists who had a very concrete plan and knew where they were going. The anti-federalists were much looser in confederation. But in some ways, some of the best arguments, though you have to dig them out, really can be found in the anti-federalist writings. Uh, so my favorite by far, I love the writings by Brutus, <laughs> despite the name. I mean, I'm not a fan of Brutus in history, uh, you know, especially through Shakespeare. But, you know, what, what a great set of writings. And the federal farmer is really good, too. And, you know, we still don't know who a lot of those people were. Uh, even in our most recent editions of the Anti-Federalist Readers, we've only got good guesses as to a lot of those people. But one of the one of the persons that I admire most who may have been uh, an Anti-Federalist, or we know she was, but she may have actually been an author of some of the Anti-Federalist papers, was Mercy Otis Warren. And you know, I think she is an excellent historian and obviously a great revolutionary. But the fact that she may have authored some of those, I, I think it's astounding as well. Just really wonderful. You know, I almost think that before we talk much in detail about the Federalists and Anti-Federalists and who these people actually were, we kind of have to step back to 
uh, just before the revolution and talk about especially this concept that historians have of the first and second patriot coalition. I think that comes from Barbara Clark Smith. Um, that originally, you know, there's this first patriot coalition of average people in the streets uh, protesting British policies uh, that affect them the most. And then, uh, closer to the actual time of the revolution, they sort of get joined by the upper, more elite folks like the Sons of Liberty, and you have this sort of coalescence of two different patriot coalitions that are actually able to, through their combined efforts, uh, secure independence. But then they just break apart again uh, in the 1780s and sort of form up into, again, their, their different uh, sort of natural coalitions and sort of scramble for control of some kind of new governing institutions. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how those earlier conflicts led up to what we see dividing people's opinion uh, in the debates, debates over the convention. Yeah, that's a great point, Anthony. And, and I have to admit, I've not read her scholarship, but that sounds fascinating. And I, I that's my error that I've not read that. Uh, it does sound very similar to, similar to Pauline Mayer's work in mm -hmm. uh, American Scripture and Ratification, where she makes the same point that there is this kind of just broad spread support, uh, widespread support, broad support, broad base of support for much of the revolutionary ideals and that the really the Continental Congress is late coming to all of this and is trying to play catch up. Yeah, you know, there had been roughly 200 separate declarations of independence by the time that the official one from the Second Continental Congress came. And yeah, that I think that speaks volumes about how important this was as a people. And I, I'd also reference this too, Anthony, to the work of Bernard Balin and Gordon Wood. And you know, I think maybe they, in some ways, in their kind of neo-Whiggism, maybe take the determinism of ideas too far. But at the same time, you know, when we look at the intellectual origins of the founding, there are so many widespread ideas, especially coming out of the old Cato papers and Cato a tragedy and so many of the newspaper editorials and things that, you know, the average intelligent citizen, and of course, Americans at that point are deeply literate, mostly because of their Protestant background. Uh, they know how to read, they know how to write. They, it's a huge part of their culture. So it, it's not surprising that at the very beginning of the movement, you do have have so much widespread support. And again, here's Liberty Fund publishing you know, those various works by Don Lutz that he's edited and Charles Heinemann. You know, some really great collections of those pamphlets and sermons and so many things that were circulating among really just normal, intelligent people, how much that really did shape the American founding. And it, it does, you know, not that I would ever diminish what Thomas Jefferson did with the Declaration, but when you start reading things like the, the pamphlets of Demophilius and you read uh, Richard Brands and all these others that were circulating in the 1760s and 70s, you really see that a lot of that small W Whig thought really was in the population as a whole. So then uh, by the time we do get to the ratification debates, who really are these people? I mean, one of the points that I kept bringing up during the discussion was that, hey, only six to eight percent of Americans ever voted for this thing, the Constitution. That's an extraordinarily tiny number of people for, for such a democratic republic or however you'd want sure. to style this, this government. That's a, that's a tiny number of people who ever positively express their consent to it. Um, so uh, not that not that your vote actually counts as consent, but, you know, um, you know what I mean. I'm with you. Don't worry. Let's not get all Spooner here already. We're about 70 years too early for that. Um, so who were these people then by the by the early 1790s? Say yeah. who who what did your average Federalist look like? talk like? What did they do for a living? What did they think and why? And yeah. the same for your average anti-Federalist. Yeah, you know, I, I think there should always be time for Spooner, Anthony. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm in sympathy. Uh, but yes, that would be a little ahistorical to place him on the founding. Um, you know, it, it is really interesting because we have you know, our best guess that probably about 
you know, 10 to 25 percent of the American population, give or take a day or where a battle is or what horrible things have just happened, are either in favor of the American Revolution or deeply against it. And we know that throughout much of the course of the war, and it means that most people are in the middle ground. Uh, not surprisingly, you know, look at what we do today. I mean, imagine in a pre-social media world, probably only a certain percentage of people really, really care about an issue. Now, in a social media world, of course, there's a, yeah, that's a different issue. We've got caring, but it may be kind of well. It seems superficial. At least it changes quite readily um, what that feeling is. But then, of course, when we get to something like the U.S. Constitution, as you said, and I thought your points were excellent, we've really got a very small percentage of Americans putting this thing into effect. And you know, the only answer I really have as a historian, Anthony, and I'm sure you have the same answer, is whatever consent was given at the time, clearly this thing by tradition has taken on a kind of life of its own. You know, the idea, I mean, we could, I think we can very readily make a historical argument that there was a lot of Machiavellian craftiness in getting the Constitution passed. But I think we'd be foolish to suggest that somehow this thing isn't real now. Obviously, it is real. And we may be able to kind of chip at the edges of it and say, look, where is its legitimacy? But clearly, it's taken on a life of its own. And you know, that's where I think when we're thinking about these questions, I am very curious who supported it, who didn't. Uh, it strikes me from the, the things that I've seen and the evidence we have that you've got this interesting coalition of people who are essentially on the frontier, which of course would have been a major part of the American population in the 1780s, and these people who would be kind of budding evangelicals who really did kind of support the anti-federalist side, and then kind of shift at the last minute, uh, in large part because they were worried, and then they had their worries kind of calm down whether or not this would be the, the the federalist side and the Constitution would bring in kind of an Anglican hegemony. So, you know, I think there were a lot of religious sentiments that went into this as well. But you know, it's also interesting that there weren't really shots fired after the Constitution was put into effect. Uh, we're going to have to wait until the Civil War for there to be real bloodshed over the meaning of the Constitution. So even Shays' Rebellion isn't really about the Constitution. Um, you know, or excuse me, the Whiskey Rebellion. It's about other things going on that that's related to it, but not quite that. Do you think uh, there's any truth to the sort of classic uh, progressive? Charles and Mary Beard uh, economic interpretation of the Constitution that this was all the, the, the uh, creature of a bunch of bankers and merchant capitalists and planters trying to protect their interests and there isn't much ideology involved in it. You know, I've always been fascinated by that, Anthony, and I would guess you have as well. Um, and most of that I got not through the beards, but through Forrest McDonald, um, and especially reading. Yeah, he was so heavily influenced by that progressivism, which is interesting considering what a conservative he was. But he was deeply influenced by that. And you can find, you know, it's all over his biographies, everything that he was writing. So that shaped me pretty dramatically. But from my own exploration, you know, especially in my work on Charles Carroll of Carrollton and and, and George Washington and some of the others, that it, that just doesn't play out from what I've seen. Uh, these guys like Washington and Carroll were putting huge amounts of their own personal resources on the line, and you know, both lost incredible amounts of money by supporting the revolutionary cause and the Continental Army. So you know, and you go back and you look, and even someone I'm not a huge fan of Hamilton, though I think he's a fascinating guy, but if you go back and look at the debates that he was a part of when he was in Congress, you know, so much of that early Congress was just dedicated to trying to figure out if anyone was benefiting from the laws. And you know, that, that, uh, the fact that that took up, and I can't give a percentage, I'm guessing from my reading, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of Congress's time just to investigate and make sure that no congressperson, no congressman at the time, right, is getting uh, special benefits from the laws. I, I find that pretty convincing that the progressive ideal of self-interest was not that it was not that clear at the time. I think, in fact, if anything, the evidence is against it. 
No, I, I think of you, let's say, first and foremost, at least, as a kind of a cultural historian of the early American mythos. You know, you, you, do, you do the West in American history, you do Jacksonian America, um, you sort of do these early Republican ideas and ideals. Um, you know, let's say, a historian of the, the people's romance about themselves <laughs> and their own ideas. You know? Can we say a romantic um, historian? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I, I, I like that, actually. Uh, <laughs> now, how, I'm wondering, though, how do, you, how do you think that federalism and anti-federalism as themes fit into the stories that you usually tell uh, about the 19th century? You know, we, we had talked about this briefly at the conference, but I, I take a lot from Bruce Fronin's work on anti-federalism. And one of the points that he makes in, I think, his excellent work that he did for Regnery and his anti-federalist reader, one of the points he makes is that because this all happened prior to the French Revolution, and his argument's more complicated than that, but because so much of what was going on in America in the 1770s and 80s was prior to that, it was really, and not just prior, but it was really kind of the last moment in which you can have true friends really disagreeing with one another without there being a, a necessity of bloodshed afterwards. So you, know, you can go into the Constitutional Convention and you can have uh, a Luther Martin and you can have an Alexander Hamilton who are diametrically opposed to one another. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen Independence Hall. It's tiny. Uh, this was in a very hot, humid summer in Philadelphia. We don't have deodorant yet. You've got 55 guys in this very tiny room. I'm sure tempers flared. And yet at the end of that, you know, these guys always go out and they share their Madeira with one another. And the same thing was generally true after the Federalists and Anti-Federalists debated as well. And I, I think that's very telling that it's a different world. Now, I think we could put a cynical spin on that and say, look, these are all politicians who are just trying to get done what they need to get done. But Bruce's point is, if we take their ideas seriously, they really do seem to be the kind of last really the, the last moment, the last manifestation of non-ideological politics in the modern world. And after that, we basically shift to a kind of extremism where it does become violent and everything becomes a kind of end of the earth matter and you're destroying the American Republic. And, and you know, I'm sure there are arguments to go against that, but I do find Fronin pretty convincing on that. Our warmest thanks to Professor Berzer for an invigorating discussion, a terribly fun weekend, and why not, a great recent book on Andrew Jackson. And that's where we'll turn next week on Ideas in Progress. So subscribe now on iTunes or SoundCloud, toss us a rating and review, and see you next week.